Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello everybody, Bob Lust, the Pond Boss, coming at you live right here from uh, Lusk Landing on the shores of the Brazos River. So I uh, thought we'd hang out for about an hour or so and see what we can make happen. Talk about some things, do some, uh, I thought tonight we'd talk about small ponds and things you can do with small bodies of water. So uh, let's uh, kind of tie into this thing and get rocking and rolling and see what we can do. Trying to read through my messages here. I got a little thing telling me that I need to take some action, which I'm not going to do. So uh, let me know you're here. See, we got four viewers, one reaction, one share. Hey, you guys know the drill. Hey, there's Doug Cusick. Good to see you, Doug. You guys know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like and share this to your timeline. You'll be eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and something else that uh, Lee Ann comes up with. You'll also know the drill, Pond Boss Magazine. 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a year. <laughs> Look at there, there's Danny Mac. A little bit cooler tonight than it was last night, isn't it? Chuck, Frank, Ryan. Good to see you. Ryan Clark's a first-timer. Good to see you, buddy. So here's the way we're going to play the game tonight. I'm going to start talking about small ponds and what you guys can do with them and how to take care of them and just some topics along those lines. And then when you have questions... Pitch them out to me. So, Ryan, if you've got questions as a first-timer, bring it on. If uh, you just want to kind of sit back and soak it in, I get that too. So, um, hey, Jason Nepstead, good to see you. Let's see what we got. Let me see here. Jason's over in North Carolina. Let's see. Frank James, Louisiana. Danny Mac, San Antonio. Doug, I forgot where you're from. Oops. <laughs> I try to remember all these things, but sometimes I don't. So what I thought I'd talk about is small ponds, and here we are, uh, good gosh, the end of November, 1st of December. It's going to get cold. You know, our ponds' production levels are dropping right now, which means aquatic plants are dying back, going dormant, which means your plankton blooms are dying back, going dormant, which means, hey, there's Wayne, Wayne and Josie. We need to catch up with you guys. I keep saying that, and then I don't call you, but by golly, I will. I promise. We need to catch up. I want to hear how things are going with the house you guys are building, and or maybe I don't. <laughs> I know what that's like. Believe me, <clears throat> we've gone through that here. But um, anyway, okay, Doug's in Wichita, Kansas, Western Kingman County. Oh my gosh, man, I have been there a lot. There's Josiah from up north of Joplin, north of Springfield, actually. Um, <laughs> Jason Nipst has been chasing. Cormorants all day with his new drone. Huh. Oh, maybe not. Huh. Okay. <laughs> um, Doug, what I was going to tell you is, is is early on in my career, once I, I started in January of 1980, and that was the year the state of Texas stopped giving away free fish. And people had to start buying fish in Texas to stock their ponds and lakes. Well, as I started searching around, there was no internet. You know, there was no cell phones, nothing like that. I paid 25 cents a minute long distance charges to talk on the phone. Information I got were from people that have already done it, or if I figured it out by doing it, or in books. Well, there's nothing better than uh, getting out there learning how to do it. So, uh, Doug's out at the deer, out the farm deer hunting. I, I love that idea. It's probably pretty chilly up there right now. Anyway, there were only just a handful of places I could go buy fish in Kingman, Kansas, Hartley Fish Farms was the very first place that I ever bought largemouth bass, fingerlings, and bluegills, and they absolutely raised the best northern strain bass I've ever seen. Still do. The boys are doing it now. I got to meet Bus Hartley and learn from him way back in the early 80s while he was still with us. And then if I wanted to get Florida bass, I had to go to Ocala, Florida to get Coppernose bluegill and Florida bass. Otherwise, channel catfish and fatted minnows came from Lone Oak, Arkansas. Well, it took five or six years after that before other bigger producers in, in Arkansas and Mississippi Delta started raising sport fish. So I spent a whole lot of time up there. So you know the Hartleys, I see. 
those guys, Billy, and uh, I think he calls himself Bill now, but back then it was Billy. <laughs> and uh, I think Philip was one of them, and Jerry, the Hartleys. And there was a, there's a sister in there somewhere, too. Hello, Todd Austin. You got the drill. Uh-oh, screen is frozen, Frank says. My screen is not frozen, so I don't know what's going on with that. I, I do have high-speed internet, so it shouldn't be on my end, but I don't know. I mean, how do I know? So, uh, anyway, let's talk about small ponds. I want to talk about small ponds, managing little ponds. You know, I get I get calls very often, emails very often for people asking me what they can do or what can be done with, uh, hello, Kirk McGlamory from Dripping Springs out west of Austin. Um, Josiah has stocked a couple ponds but can't catch much, and Jim Allen is checking in from Kentucky. Okay, so people ask me, how small of a pond can I grow fish in? Well, a lot of that depends on what you want to do with it. So, uh... Over at Lusk Lodge, comma two that we sold about two years ago, we had eight ponds on 11 acres, and two of those ponds were a tenth of an acre apiece. Now, I want to give you a little bit of math to kind of give you some background on what this looks like. One acre is about the size of a football field. It's 43,560 square feet. And so these ponds, as I recall, were about 50 feet wide, maybe a little wider than that, and 75 feet long. But Virgil Meyer had to search to find tonight. You know, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, why things are. I don't know why you're having to search for that. You should be getting some. Uh, uh, you should be getting an, a, a message that this is coming. So anyway, in those two tenth acre hatchery ponds, even though they were side by side, they were a little bit different. The, uh, one of them was a little shallower in the shallower end, a little shallower in the deeper end. But that pond, holy cow, that thing grew a whole lot of bait fish. Now, I used them to grow bluegills with. Um, you know what? Let's see. Have I ever grown any big me metal mega lotus? I don't even know what a mega lotus is. Mega, I'm going to look it up so I don't look so stupid. Mega lotus lipomus. Oh, you're playing a game on me. Megalotus, have I grown any giant bluegills? Or great ear, wait, what, what's a great ear? Megalotus, great ear, I don't know. Oh, long ear sun, yeah, okay, have I ever grown any long ear sunfish? Yes, not on purpose. <laughs> I've grown quite a few long ear sunfish in the areas where they're native to the watershed. But they'll come to feed, um, they'll interact with bluegills, but they don't get very big. So, yes, I have grown some of those before. I didn't know what megalotus was. I thought megalotus was a play on words. I'll tell you how much Latin I know. So, um, anyway, in those, that, that, hello, Travis Smith. Hey, Peyton, good to see you, buddy. Peyton's checking in from Shreveport, Louisiana. I don't know where Travis is hanging out tonight. You never know where he's going to be. So, that uh, the two tenth acre ponds, I had a north one and a south one. They were right side by side. And, uh, to kind of give you an idea, a 10th acre pond might be as big as the end zone of a football field. Well, there were several years where we would, what, what I would do, here's what I would do. Most of the time I would stock like 30 adults, 10 males and 20 females, and just let them spawn. I did that several years. And holy cow, when I did that, by the, and I would make sure those were there in the spring, make sure the pond had a good bloom, when the bloom got dense in the heat, I would exchange water because I had a well where I could flush water out. I could drain water out and flush water in if I wanted to, which I did do that. But I fed the heck out of them and made sure that we had a really good plankton bloom. And uh, there were several years where I would harvest at least 12,000 babies in the inch and a quarter to inch and a half size class. And with those, there'd be another couple of thousand that were maybe two and a half to three inches long, several hundred that were four or five inches long, and then the adults, you know, that were by that time eight, nine, seven, eight, nine inches long. So I could grow a whole lot of bait fish or a lot of bluegills in a small pond. Now, if you want to grow fish in a small pond, you can. You got to remember, nothing changes with the fundamental principles. Happy water, first thing, most important. If you don't have good, healthy, happy water, nothing's going to grow. That's part of the reason in those 10th acre ponds, 
I had them fixed to where I could pump fresh well water in at 50 gallons a minute, 60 gallons a minute, and I could flush water out through a bottom water drain pipe with a valve on it. You know, so I could keep the plankton bloom managed, I could feed the heck out of them, and not have water quality issues. Water quality, first. Second thing is if you want to use it for a sport fish fishery, then you need good, good habitat. You know, then you got to have the right kind of food, have the food chain for the fish. You got to have the right genetics if you want any kind of decent growth or native fish. You know, and then the fifth thing is a harvest plan. Look at a pond like our garden. I say this all the time. So in a 10th acre pond, what could you expect as a sport fishing pond? You can expect anywhere from 30 to 60 pounds of bluegills maybe 20, up to 20 pounds of bass if you manage it intently. So you're not going to have a lot of mass if you're managing for a sport fish pond. Now if you want to use a 10th acre pond to, to grow catfish, you can sure do that. You can produce several hundred pounds of catfish through the course of a year. Now the way I would do that is I stock a couple hundred, feed them, and then once they start hitting about a pound and a half, pound and a quarter, start culling. Take those eaters out and then the smaller fish will come right in behind them and keep growing. You'll never have that many pounds of fish at one time, but you can sure stagger them out and uh, harvest them over the course of a year. <clears throat> about a one acre pond, you know, uh, you know all, all the literature, American Fishery Society, most biologists like me are going to tell you don't stock bass in a pond less than an acre. But I'm also going to tell you in these days and times that's just kind of a general rule. Uh, with feed train largemouth bass out there now, you can stock, you can stock them a little heavier. You can grow more if you're willing to feed them. So feeding is a pretty good commitment. To small waters, if you want to grow very many fish. You know now, one thing that was real important to Debbie when I was uh, when she and I lived at LL Comma Two, she likes color, <laughs> and I've told this story on the show several times, but she. Uh, talked me into getting some real colorful Japanese koi, and I loved it. You know, I didn't want that because I'm a sport fish guy. But when we put them in that pond that where you could see them from our patio, during the springtime, she would sit out and have coffee, and those koi would come to the edge, and they would flounce around. And what she didn't realize the first few times is they were spawning. <laughs> and once she got to see how they spawned, she'd be out there almost every morning watching those fish. And when the feeder went off, here they come. I think we started with three dozen, you know, 36, we had some attrition, went down to 25 or so, then I added more as we went. So uh, um, it was fun. Uh, they grew really well. That pond was about half an acre. So there's a number of things you can do with small bodies of water. The thing I love about small ponds is if you want to change it, you can change it in one day. You know, whereas like Virgil Meyer is up in Iowa, Virgil's got about a seven or eight acre lake up there, and his would be pretty easy to change, but it would be a little little harder than a one quarter acre or a half acre or a one acre pond, but not nearly like trying to change a 20 acre lake. You know, by the time you get to a 20 acre lake, you're looking at almost something like a locomotive. You know, once that train gets going, it's really hard to stop and turn around. You know, where what with Virgil's lake up there in Iowa, uh, once his lake gets to the point where it's producing sport fish, he's got his forage fish in there now. His lake is probably a couple of feet from being full. And next spring he'll add his uh, some of his game fish for sure. And then 18 months to two years later, he'll be having some fish that he can harvest. You know, and then you get to be selective about what you harvest. You know, so small ponds, I, I, remember, I remember one time, um, gosh, this had to be, in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s, I'd gotten to know Ray Scott with BASS. He and I'd become friends, and and we were flying up to to Minnesota to go into Canada to the Boundary Waters to go smallmouth bass and walleye fishing, try to catch a few northern pike. And we connected, I think, in Kansas City or I can't remember. We connected somewhere, and I climbed on the plane, and he was already there, and I got to sit down by him and. When the plane take off, you know what? I'll tell you what, we connected, he connected in Dallas, Fort Worth. I flew from DFW to Minneapolis. That's how it worked. So when the plane took off, he's sitting by the window, I'm sitting beside him, 
He says, Pond Boss, he says, look at all those little sparkles down there. And I picked out the window, and man, it looked like a bunch of little diamonds down there. He says, you know what? Every one of those has got room for something to grow in it. And I said, you know, Ray, they do. They sure do. And so, you know, most of what we were seeing were little bitty ponds anywhere from from a quarter acre up to two or three acres, and there were literally thousands of them dotting the landscape. And just kind of for info, in uh, Texas, there's somewhere around 1.3 million private ponds and lakes and scattered across the nation. It's more like 6.5 million private ponds and lakes, and a fraction of those are managed. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do with your pond. <clears throat> One of the things that was that Debbie loved about our small ponds was um, just she wanted it to look good. She wanted the right kinds of plants. You know, she wanted to be able to see the fish spawn. She wanted enough clarity in the water where she could see the bass on the nests. She could see the bluegills on the nests. So that was all a pretty big deal. Water, water tonight. I've been keeping a pretty rigorous pace. And I'm getting tired. Drinking water. Travis is in Louisiana. We got a lot of folks in Louisiana. Looky there. Travis got a little personal information going on there. So we got Travis, Peyton, Aguilard, and uh, somebody else. Um, uh, James, Frank James is. You guys are all from Louisiana. We got a good Louisiana contingent tonight. Christopher Aguilard, the uh, Boudin man. We had a really, yeah, you know, it's really interesting, Travis. We had an amazing uh, Thanksgiving. My, I've got a, uh, my oldest son lives in Phoenix, Arizona. He flew over to Houston. I picked him up at the airport. Then we went to my other son, his little brother's house with their sister. We had Thanksgiving. Those boys played golf. Let's see, I, I went there on Tuesday. Debbie got there on Wednesday. I picked Ty, my son, up at the airport on Wednesday morning. Then the boys... My daughter's fiance and my two sons went and played golf. So they were loaded up at the end of the day, 5.15, something like that, leaving the, the club where they were playing golf in northwest Houston. Pulled out on the road, took off, and this unlicensed, uninsured, illegal alien pulled out in front of them, hit them head on. Well, airbags deployed. They ended up with some some burn, kind of some friction burns on their wrists and you know bruises on their chest. Otherwise, they were okay. The the kid driving the car that uh, that pulled out in front of them, Jonathan and and my guys were in a GMC pickup, so they weren't injured quite as bad as the other guy, but he wasn't unconscious. So then we ended up having Thanksgiving, and all of our teams won. The Cowboys won. Minnesota Vikings won. My son Jonathan is married to a girl from Minnesota. And uh, my daughter, Lindsay, is engaged to a guy from Minnesota. So we saw that. Then we drove, uh, had Thanksgiving, had a great time. And then we drove on Friday to watch the Gunner Tigers play high school football. They won. And then the Aggies beat LSU. How'd that happen, guys? You Louisiana guys need to explain to me, explain to me how in the world LSU lost to the Texas Aggies. I don't get that. They shouldn't have done it. They were ranked something like fifth, and the Aggies were 105th, and it was just, just the Aggies' day. Harrison Davis, good to see you from Georgia. Charmus, we just got our three-eighth acre pond filled last Saturday. The pond is sealed with soda ash. How long can we expect the pond to continue to wick water slightly above the riprap? Well, let's see here. You know... That's, that's a good question. <clears throat> it usually, I don't know how your pond filled, if it filled with a well or if it filled with rainwater. If it filled with rainwater, I wouldn't put any fish in it until the spring because what you want to see is you want to see how much water is wicking. Now, to what typically happens and when the soil is really dry and it fills up with water, water is going to wick laterally and up into the dry soil and moisten the soil. And it typically takes it as long as a month to do that, depending on how well the soil is compacted. So, um, if it's seeping, it will continue to drop. If it's if it's wicking, it will stop dropping for the winter, 
um, which that's not totally true. You will you will have some evaporation, but you should not be losing any more than a quarter of an inch a day after the wicking stops. That's that's a pretty good general rule. Let's see here. There's Leah Grooms from Beggs, Oklahoma. Okay, Frank James, Bob, will we ever get any rain again? Yeah, I hear that. I'd like to stock either catfish or trout in my forage pond. My son has a smoker, so thought of using it. Have you ever tried smoked catfish or trout? Absolutely, yes, I have, and they're delicious. Now, if you're going to smoke trout, I mean, uh, a smoke uh, catfish, here, here's the way you need to do it. Take their, take their heads off. Leave that collar that's right behind their head. There's, a, there's a, kind of a collar in front of the ribs, and then leave the skin on them. And if you're going to smoke catfish, I like to take them and soak them in ice water brine. And I like to let them sit in that brine for at least five or six hours. And then if you can hang them in, fix it where you can hang them in your smoker. And if you can keep the smoke circulating and keep the temperature around 165 to, to, to 210 in there somewhere, it doesn't take long. If the if you want a cold smoke, 165. If you want to ramp it up just a little bit, bump them up to to 210. Somewhere you don't you don't really want them to sizzle as they smoke. So if you've got them up to 200, 210, something like that, it won't take that long depending on how big the catfish are. And then once they're smoked, it's really cool because the skin turns kind of a yellowish brown, and then you can when they're done and uh, you're ready to eat them, you just pull that skin right off. It comes right off. And then you can just take a fork and just flake that meat off, and it is absolutely delicious. Uh, the same with the trout. It just doesn't take quite as long for trout. So let's see what Kirk's got here. Kirk is asking, are the PVC artificial brush piles actually any good at holding fish? I would think real brush piles or Christmas trees would be better. <clears throat> Chris Fargalard's headed to Phoenix in a couple weeks. Ty Lusk, look him up. He's a he's a he's a Klaus um, company realtor with Keller Williams. Tell him you met his dad on online. He'll take you to dinner. <laughs> Tell him I said so. Um, so are the artificial PVC? <clears throat> I tell you where the <clears throat> the PVC artificial brush piles are pretty good. Think mass. You want space. So if you've got PVC brush piles that can cover an area that's, say, four feet tall and six feet square, those will hold fish. But if you've just got one over here and one over there and one over there, they're not as likely to hold fish. Now, let me kind of quantify that a little bit. Take a one-inch pipe, six feet long, Drop down six inches and drill a half inch hole. Spin it a quarter turn, drop six inches, drill a half inch hole. Drop six inches, turn a quarter turn, drop six inches, drill another hole. Take half inch PVC pipe, six feet long, push those through those holes. So now you've created kind of like a, a, a sparse Christmas tree. Uh, then if you can couple those together to create a reef, those will hold fish. Now, will they hold fish better than brush piles? No. But what they'll do is outlast brush piles. Now, they're, uh, here, here's the key point here. <clears throat> brush piles will hold a lot more small bait fish because of the interstitial space and the density of Christmas trees and brush. Now, you're not going to replicate the density of brush with PVC. So the PVC pipe, even though it's a fish attractor, it serves a little little bit different purpose than the brush piles and the Christmas trees. Now, when we talk about Christmas trees, if you can if you can sink those standing up, they last a lot longer. If you put them in and they're laying horizontal, they'll be worthless within about two two to three years. If you can keep them standing up, they'll lose their needles in the first six or eight months. Then they'll uh, lose their smaller twigs within about 18 months. By about year four, you've got the main limbs and the trunk. By year seven, 
you've got the biggest of the limbs in the trunk and it's pretty well not functional. So Christmas trees are better, it, they're, they're good temporarily, but you gotta add more. And uh, brush is pretty good. I mean, I, I use brush quite a bit. Like for example, when I'm, des I'm designing a lake right now near Longview, Texas, and the bulldozer guy, as, as much as we explained it to him, Try to make it clear to him, do not take the canopies off the trees. He did it anyway. So now what we've got are some lanky trees that don't have a canopy. So now what I'm having that landowner do is to take those, um, the, some tree trunks with the root balls intact and lay them with the root balls in water about four feet deep close to the shore with the trunk of the tree going out and make it fan shaped. Then I'm having him take some of the smaller limbs and create teepees in between those fanned out uh, tree trunks to try to create and simulate some brush. Then adjacent to that, where he does have some brush, I'm going to have him put two or three brush piles adjacent to those bigger trees that are laying there. So we've got a spawning bed, then we've got root balls for bait fish, then tree trunks that go out with with TPs and with brush intermingled in each each one of those segments. So that's what we did. And that's what that's what I've got him doing actually. Yep, artificial never goes away. Travis is right. Yeah, the LSU game was a nightmare, but I see Leah giving a big whoop and giggle. So uh we watched uh my sons my sons and, and, and daughter and fiance, they went to the game. And uh, they kept texting me during the game. It was pretty fun. Pretty fun watching the Aggies beat LSU, although I'm pretty stunned at that. Look at there. There's Fred Bigaman. Good to see Fred tonight. Greg Baird, Palm Boss Magazine answers questions I didn't even know I had. How do you do it? <laughs> I get a lot of questions. <laughs> and I tell you what, when I live it, eat it, and breathe it every single day. You know, I woke up this morning. I went to bed last night about 8.45. I was pooped. Well, when I go to bed at 8.45, I'm not, if I'm asleep at 9, I might sleep five or six hours. I woke up at 2.45. And I came and sat in that chair right over there that you can't see. And I wrote until about 5.15. Then I took about a 20-minute nap, climbed in my truck, drove to Athens, Texas today to the Freshwater Fishery Center for a meeting. You know, and then we were talking about ponds and fish and stuff like that all day long. Then on the way home, two and a half hours back, I was on the phone with four different people answering questions. So, Greg, I get a lot of questions. And over, 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 uh, over a long span of time, you get answers. Jim Allen. Bob, is there a rule of thumb for dewatering clay silt per foot? Um... You know, I tell you what, there, there's several ways, Jim, to skin that cat. Uh, you know, I've always been a little skeptical of dredging because it's so expensive. But there, there are times, and I can give you several examples, where dredging is by far the best idea. Now, when, when a dredge company comes in, they're going to base their... Um, bid on the volume of silt and they're going to look at it such as in cubic yards so if they see an area that say it's uh it's half an acre two feet deep that's an acre of silt they're going to figure that at about 1660 cubic yards of silt that they're going to have to pump out and they know how long it takes to do it based on the consistency of the material then with that much, they're going to pump it into a big saran sock or kind of a, of a um, dredge sock kind of a deal and let the water come out of it. Well, out of that 1,600 yards of wet dirt, about 60 or 70% of that's water. So it's going to lose over half its volume by the time the water drains out of it. So... The, the, the way that they dewater the silt is they pump it into a big sock that looks actually looks like a gigantic bed pillow. And then right beside the pond, they pump it right into that, lets the water flow out, and keeps the silt in the sock. So that's how they do that. 
So, um, but otherwise, dewatering it by draining the pond, that's another way to skin the cat. You, you cannot dewater, listen to this. I'm going to tell you this. You cannot dewater silt in a pond. Can't do it. The silt, has, the water has no place to go. Because what happens is, is, and I've seen many, many, many ponds that have been breached, um, drained, and you'll see the silt out there begin to uh, dry up. It'll shrink and crack. And you'll see these giant cracks. It might be 18 inches deep, 2 inches wide. But I guarantee you, even four years down the road, because I've seen it, if you start trying to take that layer of dry silt off, there's chocolate pudding beneath it. And it doesn't have any way to dry. It, the water can't flow out because it's, it's sitting in a pit. Then it's got a crust on top like a scab, and it ain't going to heal, so it can't get out. So the only way water can get out of silt is to get it out of the water source. So Harrison Davis is saying, can a pond have too dense of a zooplankton bloom? And if so, at what density is too much? I'm going to tell you this, no. A, a pond cannot have too dense of a zooplankton bloom. And, and now here, this, this may strike you. I mean, some of you guys are going, what? The old guy lost his mind. Well, no, here's what it is. Zooplankton, that's the key. Zooplankton are, are insects. They're bugs. They're animals. They're, they're feeders. They're eating. And the only way they can thrive is if they've got phytoplankton because that's what they eat. They're microscopic. So what happens with a zooplankton bloom is it's, it's going to feed and, and reproduce exponentially based on what it has to eat. So remember, every level in the trophic zone is going to be 10 to 1. So it takes 10 pounds of phytoplankton to grow 1 pound of zooplankton. Well, there's something that are feeding on that zooplankton as it's growing too. So the zooplankton typically, when you, get a, when you have a, 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 a phytoplankton bloom, that say it's 12 inches, you know, and we're scared, and the zooplankton kick in, then your bloom's going to automatically shift and go from 12 inches to about 18 to about 20 and then when the zooplankton run out of food, it's going to crash. And then your clarity is going to increase. So I have, I have yet to see. I've, I've seen some zooplankton blooms that spooked me a little bit. But it didn't take three or four days because it was a combination of zooplankton and phytoplankton growing. But once those zooplankton reach the tipping point, then they're going to really wipe out that phytoplankton bloom and knock it way, way, way back. There's Timothy Chestnut. He sees what to do. Good to see you. Hey, let's see. Uh, let's let's do a little pause here. Then I'm gonna hit some of the <clears throat> some of these other questions coming down the pipe. Hey, 35 bucks a year, guys. If you haven't subscribed to Pond Moss Magazine yet, and you got a pond, think you want a pond, gonna have a pond. Pond Boss, 35 dollars a year. Say it with me, guys. Cheaper than a Friday night date. <laughs> I hear some of you guys are actually saying that. That's pretty funny. And it lasts a year. So uh, all kinds of good stuff. Matter of fact, I'm just about done with the January, February issue, 10 days late. So uh, it'll be going to layout probably on Saturday. So I'm pretty jacked up about that. Um, Purina Mills. Had a relationship with those guys since 1995. I love the products. I love their R&D. I love their attitude toward our industry. What I don't love is I can't get any MVP right now, and I don't know why. Yeah, I do. It's because they made a batch of it, inventoried what they thought they could sell, sold more than they thought they could. Now they got to manufacture some more. Texas Hunter products. I just ordered a Texas Hunter feeder today for a, a brand new client who, uh, for the holidays, has bought some feed trained bass. I love stories like this. He's got about a two acre pond north of Fort Worth. And he's got a 13-year-old granddaughter who loves to fish. So his gift to her are some feed-trained largemouth bass. And so uh, she's been catching catfish, and he's renovated the pond and got new things coming, and he wants some feed-trained bass so his 13-year-old granddaughter can go out and go fishing. I love that. So he's got a Texas Hunter feeder coming. Texas Hunter products are excellent. Uh, they're... Um, uh, their customer service is the best. I love Texas Hunter. Easy Docs of Texas, David Schneiderman. And also, for you guys that love to hunt, 
do me a favor when we're through with the show and check out huntbirddog.com. That's my son Jonathan's company, and he's got a really cool idea. He's, he came up with an idea back in, in uh, February, I think. Launched it, got it going fast, got a lot of interest in it. He's raised some money from investors that are so excited about it as well. But basically, it's, 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 it's a model similar to VRBO or Airbnb for hunting. So if you love to hunt, check out uh, huntbirddog.com. Uh, it's and, and if you when you click on it, you'll see what I mean. Look at the menu because they they've got these different events and things. Actually, hey, uh, you Louisiana guys, they went to uh, Louisiana back in October on an alligator hunt with some guides that have a lot of tags. Those guides had over a thousand tags, and eight hunters went for a two day alligator hunt and they harvested one hundred and sixteen alligators. So those all those guys were tickled to death. They paid like twenty five hundred bucks to go. So the guides were happy, the hunters were happy. When part of the deal was they got to, uh, they stayed at the um, uh, the Golden Nugget, yep, um, casino hotel in Lake Charles, and then they went hunting. So they all got to got to gamble if they wanted to. They got to hang out, good food, great food, and they all took some alligator meat home. So Ryan Clark, I live in Harper's Ferry, West, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. My pond is less than a year old. It's 40 by 50 feet, deep into 7 feet. I run aeration constantly. I have 7 to 10 largemouth bass. My bluegill spawns successfully. Um, I feed about 500 fathead minnows a month, in addition to 53 to 4 inch goldfish every week. Am I doing a disservice to the bass feeding so many goldfish? No, you are not. You bass get what they need from goldfish. It's way better for the bass than it is the goldfish. <laughs> but yeah, they'll eat those goldfish. Now, if you were, if this were a three-acre pond, I'd tell you not to use goldfish to dial in on producing more bait fish with the pond. But since your pond is 40 by 50 feet, you know, that's, that's a, a 20th of an acre. That's not really big. So feeding those bass is a good idea. Now, your aeration system... Um, once your water temperature gets to the low 50s, your aeration system becomes less helpful. <clears throat> and, and I don't know enough about the climate at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, but I'm going to suggest that you guys get cold. You don't want that aeration system running to make your water get down in the low, low 30s. That'll be stressful on those bass. So where I'm going is I would shut it off when the water temperature hits the 50s. And you may be pretty close to that. Let's see, Virgil, I see your question. I think I missed one up here. Let me go back and look, because just, it just dawned on me that there was one here somewhere. Huh, okay, I got some some missing. Huh, okay. Let me see here. Okay, Virgil says, sometime can we discuss critical watch out for our waters going from open water to frozen and then to open water in the spring. Uh, the critical watch outs is mainly for predators because as the water temperature drops, predators are getting more active because the, temp the, the, the uh, fish become much more sluggish. So I'd be real, real, I'd be paying attention to otter trails, be looking for river otters. Um, in terms of the water, you know, your lake is brand new, so you're not going to have any issues with uh water quality i got a grandchild banging on the on the door trying to get in and i got it locked <laughs> hi pumpkin i'll be out in a little bit i promise <laughs> so um critical watch outs for um i'll tell you this in, in in waters that freeze like where you are one of the critical watch outs right now is big masses of aquatic plants so doing what you can to prevent winter kill so winter kill occurs because ice covers the pond. Then the pond can no longer receive oxygen from the atmosphere. Typically ice is cloudy enough that respiration occurs and uh, photosynthesis stops. So the, plant, the, the pond can't produce oxygen. So now it's full of consumers of oxygen. And one of the biggest consumers of oxygen under ice Without sunlight, there's my qualifying statement, are aquatic plants. 
So if you've got big mats of aquatic plants dying and you, you haven't started to ice over yet, and especially in small waters, I'd be real tempted to go out and pull some of those plants out with a rake and uh, get them out. Just let them dry out on the shore. Uh, if you do have a lot of aquatic plants and you have an aeration system, and Virgil, we, you don't, you, you're, this, is, this isn't you because your pond is young. It was thoughtfully designed. You don't have a gigantic amount of decaying aquatic plant matter in there. So you don't have a whole lot of issues with that. So I, I don't I can't I don't know of any critical watchouts that you have right now other than to protect your fish. That's the main thing. Christopher Aguilar, if you visit Home Depot or Lowe's in January, you can get trees almost free. Yep. Uh, how about salt cedars? Well, Timothy Chestnut, if you got salt cedars, you got salty dirt. Salt cedars are are kind of whimsical looking. They're feathery. They're uh, they don't have a lot of mass. And you'd have to tie a bunch of them together if you're going to use them for habitat, if that's what the question is. Mike Cottrell, Palapena County, Texas. Jacob West is checking in from Denison, America or somewhere. <laughs> Jacob West drove through Athens today. Well, I was at the Freshwater Fishery Center today from quarter of nine until three o'clock. So uh, Dwight Lee is a proud Mississippian. Words can't express how happy it makes me to see LSU lose. Well, both of your teams beat my team, and my team beat LSU. So there's some of us that are happy and some of us aren't. I don't know what LSU did with Ole Miss or Mississippi State this year because I didn't pay attention to it. But don't you – you know what I love about college football, guys? Guys and gals, let me tell you this. Uh, I, I – Here's what, I love college football, and I love it because what you have, you have these post-adolescent young men in full-grown men's bodies, and the coach's job is to get them to perform at peak capacity 12 or 13 times a year for 60 minutes at a time, and they can't do it. LSU was an example of that Saturday. You know, so was Texas A&M. Texas A&M... Was three and seven, you know, and now they're let's see, uh, yeah, and now they're four and seven or four and eight or whatever, whatever we are, you know. It 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 just it's just that's that's one of the reasons I love college football. I love the energy, and the SEC is pretty fun. And I've got a granddaughter banging a, a doll on my door over there. That's that noise. Let's see here. Kirk is asking, get a couple of SALs for the home pond? <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's Kevin Bjornson. Bjornson Pond Management up there in uh, in Iowa. Good to see Kevin. Let's see. Kevin's an advertiser in Palm Boss Magazine as well. So shout out to Kevin. Good to see him checking in. Jason Nip said, I'm thinking about draining my lake and starting fresh. It can only be drained down from 130 acres to around 15 acres with the depth dropping to about 2 to 3 feet. Any idea how hard it would be or expensive to kill the fish in the remaining pool of water? Is this a terrible idea? Well, Jason, since you guys just did that a few years ago, I think it's a terrible idea. And I've seen your videos, dude. I've seen those. I don't know what you're doing to make those bass jump three feet out of water to chasing those shad, but I think you guys are probably on to something pretty good there. But since you may be being hypothetical, Hey, Pumpkin, no, don't do that, baby. I'll be out in a little bit, I promise. Go play with your doll over there. Quit beating on the door. I love you. Hey, honey, she's banging on this door. <laughs> Can you kind of redirect her? Thanks. So, uh, uh, now, to go ahead and answer this hypothetical question, is any idea how hard it would be or expensive to kill the fish? It would take... It takes about a gallon of rotenone per acre foot of water to kill all the fish. Now, I haven't priced rotenone, and I know that the supply chain has been harsh. The last time I bought rotenone, it was about $100 a gallon, plus the cost of application. So, if you've got a pond down to 15 acres... Well, three feet deep, that's 45. So you're going to need 45 gallons. At, uh, that's that's $4,500 of rotenone plus the application 
to put it out and you got to be able to access that pool of water. So is it a terrible idea? If you've got a 130 acre lake that sucks, full of carp, buffalo, whatever, trash fish, and you want to restart it and you can drop it down, then yeah, that's a smart way to go. But I know your lake and I don't think you're going to do that. But I get the question. So uh, Christopher Aguilar loaded in BP last week. I'm glad you could get some. I couldn't find it. I tried to buy some last week for Jonathan's feeder. And I couldn't find it. A few weeks ago, we chatted about pulling five scales for aging from the lateral line. Since the lateral line is where their sense pores are, does this affect them at all? It does not. It seems like me pulling my toenails off. Well, yeah, I can see how you'd think that, but the scales are pretty pliable, and they come right back. You know, so, so when I'm doing it, I'll tell you how I do it. I've got a little, um, it's a little probe that you use in a science lab. It's almost like a needle on the end of a stick. And if you just take it and you just scrape right along the lateral line, you can scrape off four or five scales just like that, and you haven't done anything with it at all. So, Wesley Ellis, what's your favorite tagging system for largemouth bass? Wesley, it kind of depends on the, what our goal is. Christopher Argelard, Golden Nuggets, one of your customers. Well, my son sent them some business. <laughs> um, Wesley, my favorite tagging system, actually, I love pit tags. Now, they're expensive. Pit tags, $3.95. Last time I bought some a year ago. And the tagging gun's about 800 bucks. But when you, when you implant a, a pit tag, it ain't coming out. And it's there for the duration. Now, most people aren't going to do that unless they're very serious about their fisheries management. And they're going to tag a lot of fish. I've got one lake where we pit tagged 1,200 fish. And we were using that lake as a as a as a for some really in-depth empirical research so we had a reason to do that but uh i love floyd tags floyd tags are easy they don't cost much you know they're they're easy to to, to put in the fish and you write down the number of the tag weigh and measure the fish log it down then every time you catch fish with a tag you scrape the algae off the tag read the number and there you go so let's see here who else we got going on here? Harrison Davis. I had a 75-gallon aquarium years ago. Thought it would be a good idea to put a one-pound bass in it. Pat did quite well and would even bite my hand when I would clean the tank. What did you feed that fish? Probably had to feed it something. You were probably buying minnows by the dozen feeding that thing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Aguilar's right. College football is fun and us grown folk dwell in the rivalries. The, revelry, the, the rivalries aren't as big to me anymore as they used to be, but a little bit. Let's see here. They would. What in the world would it cost to properly restock a 135-acre private lake? It would cost about, I'm going to tell you, $400 an acre at least to do it right. And then it could be as much as $600 an acre. But I'll tell you this. For most folks that own a 135-acre lake, unless they inherited it and they choose to draw it down and restart it, they can afford to stock it. So, Ryan Clark just stumbled on some creek chubs with the size of my pond and the temp below 50 degrees. Should I not feed the bass? Yeah, feed them. Are the creek chubs consuming too much oxygen? No. 25 creek chubs, 3 inches a day. Do it. Do it. Do it. Don't even hesitate. Because you remember, as the water temperature drops, here's a cool fact. As the water temperature drops, its affinity for oxygen goes up. As the water temperature goes down, fish consume a lot less oxygen because their metabolism rate slows down. So you got a win-win deal. So go ahead and do it. Do the, do the, do the creek chubs. All right, Jeff Wallen, I'm choosing a chemical to help control weeds and pond for next year. Have you any experience with wipeout? I don't know the active ingredient in Wipeout. I don't remember. I've stopped paying attention. I've stopped paying attention to uh, herbicides like I used to. So one of the things that you got to be careful about is I do not know of any pre-emergence that you can use in a pond. Almost they're they're either systemic or they're contact killers. The herbicides that I know about, I don't know of any that that you can use as a pre-emergent. You gotta be killing the plants that are there. So Jason Nipstad is talking about his deal there. 
and uh, saving on the cost of bluegills. What's the best time to add new bluegills or shad? <clears throat> well, here's my smart aleck answer. It's when they need it. You know, so with the, uh, the best time to add new bluegill or shad. The best time to add threadfin shad, for example, is in the spring, right before they spawn, if you have a source. That's the killer deal on that. A lot of times you don't you don't have a source, and uh, I'd be looking for that now if you don't if you're not already locked in onto somebody that can supply them. Most redfin shad nowadays come out of public reservoirs, where where people go harvest them and then haul them and get done within about three or four weeks, and that typically starts occurring depending on your latitude. Starts happening around the end of March, first of April, and then depending on where you are, it ends sometime in May typically. Wesley Ellis got MVP from TSC in two days. Ordered it Sunday. Free shipping to the store. I just I wonder how much that they sell it for though. I actually stopped at a, a tractor supply store in Brenham near where Jonathan lives, and they didn't have any MVP, and neither did the the dealer. And the dealer said he'd placed an order for the last three weeks and wasn't able to get any. So I've been wanting to call uh, my guys at Purina and haven't had a chance to do that because I've been up to my elbow and and proverbial alligators. So going back to talking about small ponds, oh, I do want to tell you this. I have decided what I want to do with this show. Uh, the, the, the viewership has dropped probably because of the season, but I also think it's partly because some of what I'm talking about has gotten redundant. <clears throat> so uh, what I want to do is starting in January, I'm going to start doing one live show per month. And then when I can connect up with Chico, Chico and I are going to put together some podcasts that are topic specific. And the way I'm going to do that, I want there's two things I want to do. One is I want you guys to send me questions. You send them right here. Either email me at info at pondboss.com with a question or uh, message me on Facebook or put it right here on, on this Pond Boss Facebook page. Uh, and the questions, I will tackle those questions either in my live broadcast, which I will also take live questions, uh, or I'll use some of those questions as topics for 20 to 30 minute podcasts. I've kind of dialed in on thinking that 20 minutes topic driven podcast, 20 to 30 minutes is about what is palatable. So like if you're going to and from work, 20 minutes to get there, 30 minutes or whatever, something like that. You can listen to one that is topic driven. So we're going to see if we can't put together 10 to 15 of those and launch those about once a week and see how that goes. And uh, I haven't figured out the platform I want to use yet. I'm looking at Spotify and I've still got to learn how to use the, uh, the software and how I want to do that. But I'm going to do it where it's going to be mostly audio friendly. But I do think we're going to go ahead and video it just because we can. So that's the deal. $54 a bag for MVP. That's really not bad in today's marketplace. That's not bad at all. So uh, a couple other things about small ponds is uh, uh, Aguilar was asking about stocking new bluegill. You know, it depends on the purpose. So like in small ponds, if you want to try to grow some bluegill, you can stock you don't need to stock bluegill till the spring and stock some adults so they can reproduce. If that's the goal. You know, if you're wanting to feed some bass, it might be cheaper to feed them some minnows than it would be bluegill because you're looking at, it's hard to compare apples to oranges, pounds to head, head count. So in other words, like a 35 cent bluegill that's this big may weigh, a thousand of them may weigh eight pounds. You know, at 35 cents, 350 bucks, Eight pounds, you know, what's that work out to be? You know, $40 a pound. Where you can maybe go buy Golden Shiners for $12 a pound. Something like that. So you get a better bang for the buck. If you're going to feed some, some hungry bass that want to eat now, then that's the way to go. If you want to put uh, fingerling bluegill in so they can grow up, I'd still wait and do that in the spring because you're not going to gain any advantage. They're not going to grow any over the winter. You know, the odds of them getting eaten go up because on those bluebird days, especially in South Louisiana, they're going to get eaten. Let's see. Dwight Lee says, 
If I am putting Christmas trees in a one-acre pond in clumps of five standing trees, about how many groups should I put in the pond? In a one-acre pond, five of those groups. That's what I would do. I would put 25 standing trees, five in a group. I think that would be a good place, good place to go. You know, at least four, but I'd be looking at four or five. And if you put that in perspective, that would be five clumps in an area as big as a football field. Danny Mac's going to feed eight pounds of shiners tomorrow, and he he will know that his bass will eat those. So that giant catfish he's got. Hey, there's Matt Marsden. The podcast is a great idea. Thanks, buddy. So, uh, and and I, I will announce it here, either in writing or in my next live on what we're going to do with the podcast. But I'm going to do my best to shoot those the week after Christmas. That's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to shoot those from right here, get Chico to come over here and help me do that, and uh, see what we can do with it. So, and Matt Mars in American Fish Tree, by the way, he's checking in. Um, artificial habitat. Uh, let's see, Harrison Davis, I fed it mostly minnows from a local bait shop, yeah, in the aquarium, but we'll also feed him or her critters I would find out sound like grasshoppers and a baby turtle. I bet that was a show. <laughs> I put Pat back in the creek. I found it in and checked back on it the next evening to make sure it was it was floating on its side. It or another bass jumped out of the water. It was Pat saying he was okay. There you go. Dwight Lee, that's actually less than I was thinking. Yep, me too. Me too. Okay. So, hey, guys, looks like we're kind of getting to a, to a stopping point. So, uh, you know what, Dwight, before we go... Um, Five clumps is enough, but if you want to do more, do more. In in this case, Christmas trees and five per clump, more is actually better. Overdoing it, let me do it this way. I would put five in, five of five. That's what I would do, and I would put those in water about eight to ten feet deep, standing up about two or three feet apart. But if you want to add as many as ten clumps, nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing. All right, so I'm going to wrap us up here at 727. I'm going to call this a day. And hey, listen, I really do appreciate you guys hanging out with me tonight and uh, talking ponds and fish and asking questions. Uh, it's I think part of my mission, part of my calling is to do this. I really do. Because I know there's a lot of folks out there that like this information. And if I don't share it with you, shame on me. Because I've learned it. And if I don't convey it, then when I die, where is it going? Where you guys can take it, use it, and then you can carry on with it. So I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing next week, but, uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to be doing next week. I know I'm going to go watch the Gunner Tigers play football Friday night. They're in the quarterfinals. There's only um, eight teams left. So if they win that game, then they go to the semis. And if they win that game, they're going to state. So you guys... Uh, Check Max Preps, Gunner Tigers, and you can follow them a little bit. So I appreciate you guys, and until most likely next Wednesday, I'll, I'll, I'll make an announcement here. I'll, 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 I'll write something down to let you wanna, know what I'm going to do next Wednesday. But between now and then, I appreciate you guys watching. Adios.